When we first met Mike Ehrmantraut in Better Call Saul, he was a grouchy parking attendant. So it was clear he had a long way to go before he became the lethal enforcer we saw in Breaking Bad. He definitely had the skills and talents, thanks to his time as a soldier and a cop, but his purpose and his relationship with morality have shifted significantly over Saul's five seasons, getting him to a point where just getting by wasn't enough anymore, to a point where he is willing to be a professional soldier for Gus Fring. After a few cameo-sized appearances, the episode 5-0 gave us our first deep look into Mike as a character. We learned that Mike's son, Matt, was a cop in Philadelphia. He was clean while most of the others in the precinct were dirty. When the others offered him ill-gotten money, he went to Mike for help, and Mike insisted his son should take it. If you refuse, it makes the others nervous that you might rat. After a long argument, Mike confessed to Matty that when he was a cop, he partook in the corruption, accepting dirty money. Seeing the idyllic image of his role model father ruined broke Matty, and he finally went along with the others. But by that point, it was too late. They already didn't trust him. Matty ended up being killed by his own partners, and Mike killed them as revenge, taking a bullet in the process. That ended up being a major link in the chain of events leading Mike to Breaking Bad. That journey began when Mike first got to Albuquerque. He found Dr. Caldera, the vet who doubles as a conduit with the underworld. Mike originally went to him for his bullet wound. Then, when he found out that his daughter-in-law Stacy needed financial support, he returned to the vet looking for work. Before coming to Albuquerque, Mike had lost himself to drinking as a way to cope with the loss of his son. Seeking revenge gave him purpose, and now, seeing that his family needs help gave him renewed purpose. But how far was he willing to go? Initially, Mike drew a pretty hard line. He was not going to break knees or kill. Early on, we saw him refuse those higher paying jobs from Caldera. Instead, he took lower paying, easier work, like acting as bodyguard to Daniel Wormald. Though he does eventually take a higher paying job when Stacy needs money for a new house, a higher paying job where the buyer specifically requested him, and that buyer was Nacho Varga. Nacho needed Tuco gone, because Tuco was back on drugs, which meant he was dangerous. If he found out about Nacho's side deals, Nacho was dead. Mike prepares for the job, but ultimately decides he can't go through with it. The reasoning he gives Nacho is that it's too dangerous. Killing Tuco would draw Salamancas like flies, which would just make things even worse. So instead, he provokes Tuco into beating him up and gets him put away on assault charges. Now, Mike obviously gave Nacho some logical reasons why they shouldn't kill Tuco, but you get the feeling, and Nacho gets the feeling, that there's more at play here. Mike did not want to pull the trigger. He wanted so much to avoid killing that he turned his face into Tuco Salamanca's punching bag for a few minutes. But in the latter half of season two, Mike learns the hard way that he may need to become less rigid in that principle. It turns out that assault charges are not the only ones Tuco is facing, but also a gun charge. Hector agrees his nephew should be put away, but not for eight years. So he asks Mike to go back to the DA and claim that the gun was his. Mike refuses and continues to refuse until Hector threatens the life of his granddaughter. After that, Mike negotiates a $50,000 payday from Hector in exchange for changing his story to free Tuco from the gun charge. And it was not an easy negotiation. Mike threatened to pull a gun in front of Hector and his men, which would have gotten them both killed. After that, Mike cannot leave well enough alone. Hector threatened his family, so Mike retaliates. He robs one of Hector's trucks and leaves the driver tied up on the side of the road. He hopes this will draw police attention and put the cops onto Hector, but it doesn't work out that way. A Good Samaritan found and helped the driver. Then Hector shot that Good Samaritan in the face to ensure no witnesses. Mike learns this from Nacho, who deduced Mike was behind the robbery. Nacho points out that anyone else robbing that truck would have just killed the driver, but not Mike. 
As a result, a civilian was killed. If Mike had killed the driver, or even earlier in the process killed Tuco and stopped this chain of events, that good Samaritan would still be alive. By season 5 of Better Call Saul, and certainly by the time we get to Breaking Bad, it's safe to say Mike has gotten fairly comfortable with killing. But specifically, he's gotten comfortable with killing people in the game. In fact, in the very next episode, he tries to assassinate Hector, until Gus stops him with that note, the one that said, don't. In season 5's Bagman, we see Mike at his most Mike, when he slaughters the gang in the desert. Then, in Bad Choice Road, Jimmy asks Mike how he was able to kill them, and he explains, Them wanting to steal the seven million didn't work for me. Not to mention they wanted to shoot you in the head. It was them or it was us, cut and dried. They were in the game. That distinction between civilians and people in the game had its seeds planted in season two with the death of that good Samaritan. In fact, Mike seems to have picked up that phrase from Nacho. Nacho says to Mike about him letting the driver live, Anyone in the game would have capped him without a second thought, but this driver, he's still breathing. Then, a few episodes later, Gus tries to surmise why Mike wants Hector killed, and suggests, I understand that a civilian found the driver after you robbed the truck. Hector murdered this civilian, correct? He wasn't in the game. That's his first use of the phrase, and it happened shortly after we heard Nacho use it with him. Gus encourages Mike to make further moves against Hector, and Mike does, by sticking the DA onto his main supply route. But Mike refuses payment from Gus, assuring that his actions against Hector were personal, not business. It's still not the kind of work he wants to get paid for. But when Gus floats the possibility of Mike working for him, Mike suggests he may, depending on the work. By the end of Season 3, Mike does end up on Madrigal's payroll as a security consultant, but only as a way to launder the money he stole from Hector, so it can ultimately get to Stacy and Kaylee. In Season 4, we finally see Mike officially accept work from Gus, helping select the right engineer and overseeing their work constructing the super lab. Why did Mike take this job? There are a few major factors at play. First, it is the type of work that would be palatable to him. Gus is not asking him to kill or hurt anyone, so even if Mike's gotten a little more flexible with that idea, Gus still isn't pressing it too hard. Second, Mike essentially gets to build something, which seems to be a passion for him. Construction is something he enjoys. We see it in his projects with Kaylee, and the single flashback we've seen of his son is the two of them building a carport together. Also, when Jimmy hires Mike to pose as a handyman to fix Chuck's door, which Jimmy himself kicked down, Mike reflects on the experience, saying, Nice to fix something for once. And of course, after this rare moment of personal reflection from Mike, Jimmy's response is, Well, if that's how you feel, I got a leaky toilet back at the office. The idea of fixing things clearly stays on Mike's mind, because that night, we find him reading an issue of Family Handyman. So, Gus's offer to oversee a construction project is right in Mike's wheelhouse. Finally, Mike seems to be in a place where he's seeking purpose and action. Before Gus makes Mike the offer, in the same episode, Mike has his rant in the support group. The one where he calls out Henry for making up a story about a dead wife, and accuses the rest of the group of being All wrapped up in your sad little stories, feeding off each other's misery. In that last line, I hear Mike talking about himself to some degree, otherwise I don't think it would make him quite so angry. He doesn't want to sit there and just marinate in sadness. He wants to do something, and the next day, Gus gives him the chance. Well, we all remember how that went. Mike ends up bonding with a German engineer named Werner Ziegler before having to kill him. Before killing Werner, Mike may have been in a place where he could wrap his head around killing someone in the game, but with Werner, Mike learned that some of those people in the game are not drug lords or killers. Killing Werner probably didn't feel fair or just to Michael. On top of that, 
because Mike let the Werner situation get out of hand, he had to chase him down, which pulled a travel agent Fred Whalen into the mix, which got him killed by Lalo. Another innocent life, definitely not in the game, lost. Thanks to Mike's action, or in this case, inaction, letting Werner stray too far. Killing Werner was a tough pill for Mike to swallow, and for a time, it completely destroyed him. He returns to drinking. He yells at Kaylee when she asks about his son, specifically when she makes the observation that he decided to become a policeman, like you, she says. After that, Stacy asks Mike to keep his distance for a bit, hating himself for what he did to his son, hating himself for killing Werner, and now drifting away from his family, his purpose, Mike is just about at rock bottom. He picks a fight where the odds are stacked against him. That's what gets him nearly killed, which is how he ends up at Gus's ranch in Mexico, where we once again see Mike's need to fix and build things. Though more importantly, we see how Gus takes the broken Michael and puts him back together. They last left each other on bad terms. After having to kill Werner, Mike essentially told Gus to go to hell. But Gus still wants Mike as a soldier in his war against the Salamancas. So here, at his memorial to Max, Gus makes the offer again, and this time, Mike accepts. Why? Gus opens up to Mike in a very significant way. He brought him to this very personal place, kept totally separate from any of his business dealings. That's a major step in building a real connection with Mike and gaining his trust. He also shows Mike the power of self-acceptance. When Mike finds Gus at the fountain, he gruffly asks if Gus funds this town to balance the scales and make up for the bad he does. It makes up for nothing. I am what I am. He sets the example of being totally comfortable with yourself, rather than torturing yourself the way Mike so clearly is. Then Gus makes an observation. Mike is at a crossroads. Currently, he's chosen the path of gradual suicide, but alternatively, he can work for Gus as a soldier in a war against monsters, the Salamancas. Mike sarcastically asks, And you are so very different from them? Gus assures that he is. And finally, when Mike asks, why me? Gus answers that he believes Mike understands. What does he understand? Revenge. In this scene, Gus wins Mike's trust through vulnerability, showing this secret place. He sets an example of being comfortable with yourself and the choices you've made. He offers him purpose, something Mike desperately needs, and he appeals to Mike's sense of justice, the thing which brought the two of them together in the first place. That's what sent Mike after Hector and what brought him onto a collision course with Gus. It was an eventual revelation in Breaking Bad that much of Gus's ambitions in the drug world came from a desire or pathological need for revenge. Here, we see that this shared goal with Mike is a large part of what brought them together. He too seeks a sort of revenge. The Salamancas threaten the life of his granddaughter, and they soaked Mike's hands in the blood of innocent lives. Gus offers Mike the chance to fight that or he can keep going the way he's going and end up in an early grave. With the two paths made clear, Mike chooses Gus. He chooses self-acceptance, something made explicit a couple of episodes later, the next time he sees Stacy. I'm better now. What changed? Decided to play the cards I was dealt. Another way of saying that, like Gus, he is what he is. And like I mentioned earlier, it is shortly after this when Mike most resembles the Mike we met in Breaking Bad, the Mike for whom 1 vs 6 is a fair fight. In Bagman, any trepidation around killing is gone, as Mike slaughters most of the men going after Jimmy and kills the one who got away. Tragically, although Gus may have staved off an early grave for Mike, it is only a temporary reprieve. We know that he is destined to die thanks to a certain chemistry teacher's hubris. But at least we can take comfort in the idea that Mike was at peace with his mortality. In the same Bagman episode, when Jimmy struggles to go on, Mike tells him how he does it. Mike is fighting to provide for his family. 
He does what he does so they can have a better life. And in a moment of foreshadowing his eventual fate, Mike adds, And if I live or if I die, it really doesn't make a difference to me as long as they have what they need. So when it's my time to go, I will go knowing I did everything I could for them. Where does Mike go from here? What happens between Better Call Saul Season 5 and Breaking Bad? I don't know. Well, that's what we're going to find out in the coming weeks. So, brace yourselves. And we'll wrap it up there for now. We're approaching the end of Saw Week and... Oh, hold on a second, I'm getting a call here. Hello? Hello, One Take. This is Michael Ormantrout. Oh. Uh, hey Mike, I thought you were... Didn't, didn't Walt kill you? Yeah, thanks to his pride and ego. But it's okay, I'm up here in heaven, eating all the pimento sandwiches a guy could want. That's great. Um, what can I do for you? Well, I just wanted to say, great job with Saw Week, and wanted to ask everyone to subscribe. But don't take a half measure. Make sure to hit that bell icon too. Alright, well, there you and have I it. I know something about half measures. You oh. see, when I was a beat cop... Uh, actually, Mike, guy, we've, uh... And he was just a real piece of... Mike, we've heard this story, well, actually. let me put it this way. I would not share a pimento sandwich with him, I'll tell you that. Trying to wrap up here, Mike. And I put a gun in his mouth, and he was going to the bathroom on All right, um, with that, my... thank you for watching, and see you on the next One Take.